fit of rage and pumped it, and 52 cents later it was full. <laughs> I love to preach just behind him because I can give him such a hard time. I, I got up that night and said, my dad always filled my car up. <laughs> Never left mine almost full, but always full. But I fell in love with him that night. He is a man of, of extreme energy. I don't know where it comes from. I guess from above it has to. And uh, a man of very wonderful words, and he's going to share some of those words with us tonight. So with no further ado, John Tash, would you come and take the stage? Thank you, Pastor Van. Boy, this is kind of tall. Man, this is for a tall fella. Yeah. Paul wrote to his son in the Lord, Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the first five words, he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Let's stop right there. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now. Now. What does now mean? Now, at this moment, at this present time, don't wait, be obedient, and do it now. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Tonight, the Spirit of the Lord is speaking expressly. Look that word up, and it means clearly. The Spirit of God is speaking to us tonight. God has something to say. And I believe one of the things he wants to share with us tonight is there's an urgency of this hour. You're not, you're not, you didn't hear me. There's an urgency, folks. There's an urgency in the hour that we live today. Never have we had so much to do and so little time to do it. We have got to get busy. It is not time to quit. What are you even thinking about quitting for? Oh, I'm getting too old to do this kid stuff. Says who? Your spiritual service is not determined by your physical strength. So get up and get busy. Don't you even think about quitting. We need you. Our children and our teenagers need you. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It's not time to quit. It's time to get fired up. It's time to rise. It's time to stand. It's time to take our kids to the next level. But before we can take our kids to the next level, we have got to go to the next level. As I travel the country, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing moms and dads getting all fired up. Moms and dads going to this conference and moms and dads going to that, this convention. And they're going to new levels in Christ Jesus. But they're leaving their kids behind. Moms and dads are going to new levels in Christ Jesus. But they're leaving their kids behind. It's time to reach up. Reach out and pull your kids up with you. As you go to new levels in Christ Jesus, by golly molly, take your kids with you. It's time that the gifts of the Spirit are unleashed in our services. It's time that the love of God is demonstrated. It's time that signs and wonders begin to flow. It's time that the teaching and our messages and our preaching is anointed. How do you know it's anointed? <laughs> Very easy. When the burdens are, come on, lifted. Lives are changed. Bodies are healed. People are saved. Young people are delivered. You see, my Bible says, and the disciples went forth 
preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with what? Signs and wonders following. If I'm going to go take a trip, what do I do? I get out my map and I look for the signs. When I'm going to take a trip, I get out my map and I look for the signs. I get out my map and I look for the signs. I'm going to need a little help in the audience tonight to help me. It's time, folks. It's time. It's time to be courageous. That's what God told Joshua over and over again in Joshua chapter 1. Son, be strong and of good courage. What's he saying to us? Be courageous. And God will do the outrageous. How long, how long do we have to know him before we trust him? Come on, saints. We've got a job that needs to be done. I trust tonight, man, your ears are open. I'll say what Jesus said. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Are you hearing tonight? Because the Spirit of the Lord is speaking expressly. He's speaking very clear, loud and clear. There's an urgency in this time, in this hour. We have got to get this work done. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm. Just lift up your hands where you're sitting. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on. Come on. I, I come against every, every lazy, apathetic, complacent spirit. In this house tonight, you have no right and no place. <laughs> Come on, Holy Ghost. 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 Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Turn there if you would, please. I know you know it, but I want you to turn there. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, say glory. glory. We will wait for the glory. I love waiting for the glory. Arise, shine, for the light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon us. My God, we're living in awesome days, folks. We are living in such awesome, awesome days. We sang about it tonight. The worship team, the, the band sang about it tonight. Talking about asking the Lord for the rain. I just read it this, this afternoon out of my flight from Dallas to, to Atlanta. In Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1 it says, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. Why do we have to ask the Lord for rain? Rain in the time of the latter rain? Uh -huh. He's talking about the last days. The last days, and we are living in the last of the last days. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And, and, let's stop right there. What does and mean? That means he didn't finish his thought. So let's go up to 16. Verse, uh, ver verse 16. Let's go up to 15. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seen as but the third hour of the day. But this is that, this is that, this is, underline that. But this is that, this is that, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. It will come to pass. With or without you, it's going to come to pass. It will happen, folks. But you're here tonight for a reason. You're here because God wants you to be part of this last day harvest. Of bringing in the harvest. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will. I will. I 
will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I will pour out of my spirit. Can I have that glass? Oh, boy. Rocky. And I want to put that Bible aside. <clears throat> Matter of fact, bring that chair right, right over here. Right here. Yeah. You can't bring that chair. Okay. Um. We got a chair? There you go. Rocky, I just want you to sit down in the chair when they get it for you. This is, oh, praise God. He isn't, but the chair is. I don't want you to ever forget what I'm about ready to do, Rocky. You won't. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. In the last days... Saith God, I will, I will, I will, I will pour out of my spirit. Now that word pour in the Greek is a very interesting word. You see, I am going to pour water on top of Brother Rocky. I am pouring water on top of Brother Rocky, I am pouring water on top of Brother Rocky. But this, hey, wait a minute. The best part's yet to come. You see, I have poured, I have poured water upon Brother Rocky, but I have restrained myself. I have held back. <laughs> yes, I have been... Very nice to you. I have restrained myself. And throughout history, God, our Heavenly Father, has been pouring out His Spirit, but He has been pouring it out only in a measure. He has restrained Himself. He has kept back. He has held back. But in the last days, Acts chapter 2, verse 17... This word pour does not mean to hold back. This word pour in the Greek, I trust you're going to write it down in your Bible. Because it'll change your life, it'll change your home, and it'll change your ministry. Because we are living in these last days where God is pouring out. You ready, you ready for me to tell you what that word pour means? Raise your hand. Raise your right hand and say, I want to know. All right, to pour out, when God says in the last days I'm going to pour out, that word pour means to let loose without restraint. To let loose without restraint. That means he's not going to hold back any longer. He's not going to hold back any longer. He's going to pour out without restraint upon his sons and his daughters. He is no longer holding back, folks. My God, get it in your spirit. Get it in your mind. Get it in your thoughts. Get it in your body. My God is not holding back any longer. He is pouring out his spirit upon our sons and our daughters. He is letting loose without restraint. Now, folks, I ran out. I ran out. And Brother Rocky says, it's a good thing. But God, our Heavenly Father, doesn't run out. That's why it says, I will pour out of my spirit. Notice it does not say, I will pour out my spirit. It's out of my spirit. That means it's an endless supply. Once God, our Heavenly Father, begins to pour out. My God is without restraint. It just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. But it does, I hope this doesn't, 
I hope you get this. It does not take a lightning brain to figure this out. But this, this verse in, in, in Acts chapter 2 verse 17 says, Upon our sons and our daughters. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, you are either a son or a daughter. <laughs> we often think of our children as sons and daughters. But do you know that you are either a son? How many sons we have in the house tonight? Or you're a daughter. Daughters. Guess what? In the last days, saith God, he's going to pour out his spirit upon the sons and on the daughters. And on the daughters. You say, well, I don't. My, my kids aren't prophesying. My kids aren't on fire for God. I can tell you why. I might not be invited back. But I'm going to tell you why. Be, if you're not seeing it in your sons and your daughters, your kids and your church, it's because they're not seeing it in you. Yeah, you're right. I'm going to be kicking you in the pants tonight. But I'm not going to be kicking you down. I'm going to be kicking you up. Because it's time for us to stand up. Instead of being a, having a wishbone, you get a backbone to yourself. Well, you know, the preacher didn't shake my hand that Sunday. Come on, grow up. I love Joyce Meyer's, thank you, my brother. I love Joyce Meyer's message that she preached a little while ago. She says, if you want to go up, grow up. I was reading this just a, a couple weeks ago. Lamentations. Lamentations. To lament. You know why the nation of Israel was lamenting? You know why it's called lamentations, folks? Read through. Read through that small book. It says when the men and the women stop praising and singing to God, the children stop singing and praising God. We don't need more teachers. You know what we need? We need fathers. Fathers. Fathers of the faith that will train sons and daughters. And I'm specifically talking to men. Men. We need fathers that will train their sons and their daughters in the things in the spirit. We've got too many women that are doing the men's job. Praise God for you women that have blessed God for years. You've kept this thing going. You are to be commended. God has poured out a spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. All flesh. Before I go any further... What's your name, brother? Michael? Grab the end of their end. This is what you got to be doing all week, folks. To every person that instructs you, pull, brother Michael, on the anointing. Pull. How much of this do you want, brother? How much of the gift of God do you want? Yeah, yeah. Give it to that brother right over there. <laughs> that brother right there. Listen, folks, for every instructor that comes in this place, you've got to pull on the anointing. They wanted it bad, man. <laughs> you see? Grab that, Brother Michael. You see? The rope is our faith. Like common faith. What is the pull? It's the hunger that you have. And you know, I can tell if you're hungry. I can tell. I can just tell by looking at your face, watching you for five, ten minutes, how hungry you are. How much of God do you really want? You know, God shows up when you're hungry. <laughs> God shows up when you're hungry. Are you hungry? Yeah. Sir, are you hungry? 
I gotta have more, I gotta have more, I gotta have more. I can't live on yesterday's blessing. I can't live on yesterday's manna. Neither can your children. What we've been feeding our kids. Forget it. Should I say? I think that's why God said to the children of Israel, take enough for today. I'll provide for tomorrow. Say, I think it's a lesson that each one of us should know when we're ministering to our kids. They need a fresh rain of word every time you see them. You only have them for, short, for such a short time. Turn to Acts chapter 3. We all know the story. Mm, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. You know what our children need? It's a generational blessing. For years, we've heard about the generational curse. It's time that we give them the generational blessing. It's time that we give our children the generational anointing. Pass it on. Pass it on. As I've studied revivals throughout history, I asked God, I said, God, why in the world do these revivals only last four or five years? And you know, there's people around the world that are waiting for this one to stop. They're waiting for this one to stop. But you know, one of the things that's going to keep this revival going? Those kids right up there. <laughs> Pastor Van, they're the ones who are going to keep this thing going. God said to me, I, I said, God, why did these revivals stop? I mean, so many great things were taking place, he said, because it was not passed on to the next generation. We have a responsibility, sons and daughters. We have a responsibility. We're talking about young warriors. The, 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 the theme of this, this uh, Children's Leaders Conference, young warriors. Well, we can't have young warriors unless we have old warriors to train the young warriors. Oh, should I use another word? I'm sorry. Did I offend you? I didn't mean to call you old. <clears throat> Let's use a better word, mature. In order to have young warriors, we've got to have mature warriors that have already been out in the battlefield and know how to fight. But we've got so many of our older warriors that don't, don't know how to fight. They don't know how to believe God for a pair of socks. Am I right? Okay, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, oh, I love that word certain. I'm underlining. Every time I'm reading, I find that word certain in the Bible, I underline it. I love that word certain. A certain man, a certain woman. Jesus went into a certain town at a, a certain hour. Hey, this could be the certain time. This could be the certain conference where God shows up big time big time and a certain and a certain lame man man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked, his, asked alms and Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said look on us and he gave heed unto them, ooh, I like these next words, expecting to receive. Go back to the verse 2. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, or he was brought to the gate beautiful and laid there every day. They carried this man every day and placed him at the gate beautiful. And why did they do that? Verse 5, expecting to receive something. You see, when moms and dads bring their children and they place them in your care on Sunday morning, when they lay them at your feet, or when they 
in today's vernacular, drop them off. They're expecting their children to receive something. And if you got nothing in there, nothing will come out. If, if you're always digging from the bottom of the barrel every Sunday morning, oh God, I need your anointing to preach today. <laughs> oh God! I know I've been there. Come on. Anyone else been there? Digging from the bottom of the barrel. Oh God, what am I going to teach these kids? Well, try teaching them from the overflow. Oh, it's so much better. It's called the anointing. Well, how do you get the overflow? Monday through Saturday. See, if you don't get into God's word and get in his presence Monday through Saturday, you'll never minister from the anointing. It'll never happen. It'll be wood, hay, and stubble. You see, you got to get in his presence. In Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, it says, in his, what? Presence is the fullness of joy. You know that the same word presence in the Hebrew is the word for face. In his face. In his presence. In his face. Man, we have got to get in God's face. He wants that. Oh, he longs for us to get in his presence. He, well, brother, you don't realize, you know, I'm working a full-time job and, you know, I'm just volunteering this and it's about 20, 25, 30 hours, you know. It's a, man, I'm busy. I'm busy, 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 busy. God didn't call us to be busy. God didn't call you to be busy, sir. He called you to be fruitful. And what you're doing is not fruitful. Get rid of it. Yeah? Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Silver and gold have I none. Silver and gold have I none. Silver and gold have I none. Peter and John said, sir, I ain't got no money, but I've got the anointing. See, what we're doing in our churches is the reverse. We're saying, kids, we ain't got no anointing, but we got a beautiful facility. Kids, we ain't got no anointing, but you should see our brand new curriculum. Oh, it's wonderful. What our teenagers and what our children are needing is not another video. What they're needing is a move of God. They're wanting the anointing. And if I could take every one of you and look at you eyeball to eyeball tonight, I wish I could. And just shake you. And say, my brother, my sister, do you mean business for God? If you don't get out of the way, but I know you mean business for God. That's why you're here. Our kids need a move of God. They need the anointing of God. They need a fresh word from God. In, in 2 Kings chapter 7, we read about four, four lepers. You all know the story about the famine in the land. And those four lepers said to each other, why sit we here till we die? They said, if we go backwards, we're going to die. If we stay where we are, we're going to die. We must go forward. We must go forward. You see, the easiest thing in life to do, you know what it is? Is to go backwards. You know why? It's all familiar territory. You know where the most dangerous place to be in life is? Comfortable. I'll say it again. The most dangerous place in life to be is comfortable. God doesn't want you comfortable. 
Is this foreign to you? It doesn't, it, it's not one of those, oh, bless your brother, preach it. I like this. But you need to hear it. We all need to hear it, don't we? In Exodus chapter 14, turn there, if you would, please. Exodus chapter 14. I love this portion of scripture. Starting with verse 10, and when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were so afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, would to God you would have listened to us. We wouldn't be in this predicament if you would have just listened to us. Here we are, out in the desert, ready to die. Verse 13, and Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and he shall hold, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they should what? Go forward. Forward. Why sit we here till we die, children's leaders? We have got to go forward. But you see what they did? They complained. And when you complain, you remain. When you give an attitude of voice, you create an atmosphere. When you give an attitude a voice, some of you know what I'm talking about with your own kids. When you give an attitude, watch your attitude. That's what I'm talking about. When you give an attitude a voice, it creates an atmosphere. My flight from Dallas to Atlanta this afternoon, I was trying to be spiritual. I was trying to get prepared for tonight. I was trying my hardest, but this lady in back of me, was talking to this other lady beside her. And that's all she did for two hours and 15 minutes was complain. I could not believe it. Where do you live? Well, we live in Fort Worth, Texas. And we hate it there. It's so hot in the summer. She just moved from Michigan. But I hate it in Michigan. It's so cold and so much snow. She lived in Oklahoma. We hate the tornadoes. She lived in California. She's afraid of the earthquakes. I mean, this lady had nothing good to say. That's all she did is complain. I felt like I had to repent from listening to all that for two and a half hours. But you know, we make fun of the children of Israel, but we, we do it all the time. We allow our children to complain. Maybe because we don't have a handle on it ourselves. We need to zip the lip. If we don't have anything good to say, don't say it. Many people don't go anywhere because they're all full. They're just, they, they complain all the time. You complain, you remain. Well, brother, you don't realize, you know, you know the situation at our church, in our home. Turn to Ecclesiastes 11, verse 4. This is a, a scripture that has changed my life and my ministry over the past year and a half. Ecclesiastes 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 4. You there? Okay. This is the good part. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, or chapter 11, verse 4. Let's go up to verse 3. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. Duh. 
And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. Let's skip down to verse 5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Verse 3. Some things are very easy to understand. Verse 5. Some things are very hard to understand. But sandwiched in between 3 and 5, saints of God, is verse 4. Let's read verse 4. He, he that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap. I love what the Living Bible has to say. You ready? If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. Regardless of whether you understand it or not, don't wait for the conditions to be right. We children's leaders have got to go forward. What I would, brother, if I just had more volunteers. I got a word for you. Second Corinthians chapter 9 Verse 2, you want to you know, know how to get volunteers? It's probably one of, the, one of the number one cries that I hear as I travel throughout the country. Oh, I wish I had more volunteers. How do you get volunteers? I get a volunteer and they quit on me in two weeks. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2, the end part of the verse says, Your zeal hath provoked me. Your zeal hath provoked me. Now, let's go into the Greek a little bit and you'll get a little bit understanding of it. Your zeal, your white hot passion. Zeal, your white hot passion has provoked me. You know what the word provoked means? Stimulate to action. You want to know how you're going to get volunteers instead of complaining about it? Why don't you go to the word? which says your white hot passion has stimulated me to get involved. No one wants to get on a sinking ship, brother. Well, you know, if only the pastor would make an announcement on Sunday morning that we need more nursery workers and I need more children's church workers, I wish he would do that. You know, he doesn't even announce it in the bulletin. I, you know, you know he says something about the, the, the nursing home and he does some, you know, look at this. Sister Smith is in the bulletin. She's only been involved in the singles ministry for four months, and she's got her picture and a beautiful bio in there, the bulletin. I've been involved in a children's ministry down in the basement of the church for seven and a half years, and no one even recognizes me. The pastor never, sh he never pats me on the back, never promotes my ministry. They don't even know I'm around. If I were, if I were dead, they wouldn't even know I was dead. One thing I've learned in the children's ministry, you better be a self-motivator. If you're looking for pats on the back, brother and sister, you're in the wrong ministry. But I got good news for you. If you're looking for a pat on the back, wait to heaven. Yeah, you talk about a pat on the back. Oh, yeah. Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, it says, And whosoever shall give a cup of cold water. Oh, where's my water? A cup of cold water. Where's my water? Where's my water? Fill it up. Fill it up. I promise I won't, I won't dump it on you, brother. I, I'm just... And whosoever shall give a cup... Look at this. Matthew chapter 10. This is scripture, folks. Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. Here is little Jimmy. He's seven years old. He's been on the playground. He's very hot. 
Brother, brother uh, Trey here says, uh, brother, brother John, would you would you give uh, little Jimmy, uh, Jimmy seven years old, would you give him a cup of gold, cold, uh, cold water? Ding! Guess what? I just got a reward in heaven. <laughs> Ever seen the uh, It's a Wonderful Life? You know, when ding, the bell goes off. That's what I picture. Every time, every time. Listen, if I can get, if I can get a reward by giving. <laughs> if I can get a reward for giving a child a cup of water because a disciple asked me to. Are you listening to me? It says, if I can get a cup of, if I can get a reward in heaven. To give a, a child a cup of water because a disciple asked me to. Sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so said, would you go give Johnny a cup of coal? Oh, yeah, I'll do that. I just received the reward in heaven. If I can receive a reward in heaven for doing something like that, think of how much of a reward, folks, you and I are going to receive in heaven by teaching the word of God to the children because God, our heavenly Father, has asked us to do it. My God, if you're waiting for a reward, hang on. It's coming. Big time. Big time. Well, you know, if we just had a bigger facility, you have no idea. You know the room that they gave us, Brother Mark? You know the room that they gave us? We've got to set up and tear down, set up and tear down, set up and tear down every rotten Sunday. We don't have a room of our own. But other ministries had their own room. We got we to gotta tear down. And sister, you know what? We have to share it. We have to share it as a kitchen. And then the next day it comes in and the Bible school comes in. And then the next day, and then they have the nursery coming in. We can't, what are we going to have a room of our own? We set up and tear down, set up and tear down, set up and tear down, set up and tear down. Complain, 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 remain, complain, remain, complain, remain. I've been there. I've done that. And it doesn't have to be a small church. I came from a big church, 12,000 people. You'd think we'd have our own facility. We didn't. We had a set up and tear down, set up and tear down, set up and tear down, set up and tear down. And guess who was the first one there every Sunday? The children's workers. Guess who was the last one to leave every Sunday night? The children's workers. And believe me, it was real easy for us to complain, wasn't it, Brother Michael? I'll never forget. We're going out of the maybes, and that's where we have church. Some Sundays. And another Sunday, it might be in a tent. Seriously. And another Sunday, it might be over in the gym. And another Sunday, it might be... Over in the property over here at 71st St. Louis. And we get the call Saturday morning. Ha <laughs> ha, we got good news for you. You're going to have to move your children's church. <laughs> That's what they think of the children's ministry. You know how much budget we have? Out of the whole pie. We have a little sliver. You can hardly see our budget. What can we do with what can we do with a few dollars coming in every week? What can we do with a facility like this? We we gotta set up and tear down, set up and tear down. I never forget the time that we got stuck in the elevator. <laughs> the security men were supposed to stay there until everyone was gone. They thought everyone was gone. We were still there with a keyboard in one hand and boxes in the other hand and pushing another box with my foot, trying to get it in the elevator, and the elevator got stuck in between floors. So we had to take away, we had to take apart. I couldn't, and then we rang the bell, ding, 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 ding. Hello, we're here. Someone in this big building, we're here. And you know, this fruit of the spirit, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You know how we got out of the elevator? Sister, we had to take our keyboard stand apart. And we had to stick it in between the door and pry the thing open. Enough for me to get my body. You know, he wouldn't go through. 
I had to go through, and we were in between floors. How many have been there? Come on, be honest. How many have been there? I mean, you could easily, easily complain. Well, if only we had new curriculum. This curriculum stinks. <laughs> Write your own. Well, if only the church would get into revival. I feel like I'm the only spiritual one around here. Try this. It works. Why don't you be a revival <laughs> instead of waiting for revival? That didn't get too much of a big amen. I said, why don't you be a revival instead of waiting for revival? See, if you be a revival, guess what? You'll have about 200, 300, 400 kids following you saying, I want the same thing. Give me it, give me it, give me it. See, but that's all we do. We're waiting for the perfect conditions. We're waiting for the perfect conditions when things are just right. I'll never forget what it was back in 91, 92. Michael Watson is our missions director. He came up with this idea. Let's take the kids to Mexico. Take the kids to Mexico. Brother. And he was a volunteer. A full-time volunteer. <laughs> he managed a business in Tulsa. Then he... He volunteered about 40, 45 hours for us. Let's take the kids to Mexico. And I said, take the kids to Mexico. I said, when? I've got nine weeks of camp during the summer. I've got this event and that event and this event. You know, I don't get a day off. I don't, nah, 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 nah. When are we going to have time to take the... By the way, my mission field's America. So you know what we did? We finally took our first trip to Mexico back in 1991, 92, something like that. And we had 64 kids that went with us. I couldn't, I, I, I said, I said, God, this is going to be really, really hard to know how, how these kids are going to do this. 150 bucks to go to Mexico. That's an awful lot of money, God. How are these kids ever going to get this money? I played it real safe. You know what I did? We... We stayed in America, and we crossed over the border <laughs> each day. We went back and slept in America because we didn't want to drink the water, eat the food, you know, anything like that. You know, we're playing it real safe because I've never been out of the country with 64 kids before. And as the years have gone on, we've taken over, what, 750 all over the world. We've been to Russia and Africa. Matter of fact, next week at this time, we will have a team there. What is today? Wednesday. Yeah, we will be there. We're heading off to Africa next week. St. Petersburg, Russia in December. And we've got six missions trips scheduled for the year 2000. But we've been all over the world. We've been all over Europe, uh, Central America, South America, taking kids with us because we believe it's better to prepare than repair. What do the kids do? They preach. They teach. They lay hands on the sick. They cast out devils. I never forget the time that one of our boys, I just got finished preaching to a bunch of people underneath this tent, about 500, 600 people, on how God wants to touch and heal their bodies. And I got finished preaching, and I says, everyone that wants God to touch them and heal their bodies, lift up your hands. And there had to be 200 people that raised their hand. I, I said, I, I want every one of our kids to find someone to pray for. And... I mean, those kids went off like ants and began to lay hands on different people. And I looked out on the, the right of my eye, and I see one of our boys yanking a lady out of a wheelchair. I mean, I mean, just pulling her. I mean, give me some resistance, ma'am. I mean, he was just, come on, get up, lady. And my first reaction was, oh, God, he's going to hurt this lady. I looked 10 seconds. You know, my first reaction was, one of our workers, get over there. And instruct him, that's not what you're supposed to do. Ten seconds later, I look over, and there she's walking. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never forget the time that I ministered 
at an Indian reservation. We took, I think, 48 kids with us that, that trip. And uh, I was preaching underneath this tent, and I noticed this teenage girl never came in underneath the tent, but she just stood out and she listened the entire service. After the service, one of the adults came up to me and said, uh, Pastor John, there's a teenage girl back there that's full of demons. And as she speaks, it's not her voice, it's a, it's a man's voice. Well, I just got finished preaching. I'm full of faith and power. I walk down the stairs, I start down the center aisle. I got within a, oh, probably eight, nine feet from this girl. And the Spirit of God says, don't you cast the devils out. Let the girls cast them out. I turned around, grabbed three girls that were closest to me. I says, girls, this teenager is filled with devils. Cast him out. Now, most of us would have gone, the devils? Oh, not, not me. Oh, that's the pastor's job. Not me. I don't cast out devils. I don't cast out devils. That's what most adults would do. But you know, those girls didn't do that. You know why? We trained them how to cast out devils. We taught them. They saw it. Those girls lunged at that teenage girl. I mean, lunged at her. And they cast those devils. I mean, th those girls backed that girl, that teenage girl. And as they were backing her up, out of, out of her mouth, she began to foam at the mouth. And she began to, you're not casting me out. I'm not going to get you. They backed this girl right up to the, the, the side of a pickup truck out in that parking lot. And she was totally delivered in five minutes. Totally delivered. Totally delivered. A year and a half ago, we went to, we went to the Ute Indian Reservation, three hours in the mountains east of uh, Salt Lake City. And we were invited to go to a hospital and pray for an elderly lady. You know how old she was? 44. Elderly. Elderly. Elderly, but I found out when we were there that is old. My wife, when we were there, did a funeral for a 35 year old lady. See, the average life expectancy here in America, America, our country, our country, I'm not talking about third world country, I'm talking about our country. The average life expectancy on that reservation is 40 years of age. We went up to that hospital and we surrounded the bed with our team. And a little girl, nine years old, named Faith, laid her little hands on this lady's leg that they were going to cut off because it was full of gangrene. The wheelchair and everything was right there. She said a little nine-year-old prayer, Dear Jesus, would you just heal her leg? We left that afternoon. I didn't know this until a year later when Brother Michael and his wife, Belinda, went back with another team to that same Indian reservation, and the lady that little Faith prayed for was fixing all the meals for them that entire week. Her leg completely healed, completely healed, completely whole. When we went to Africa a few years back, we took children with us then. We had one of our boys, Emmanuel, that preached to two adults underneath this huge tent, 45 minutes and how to be an effective witness. He preached. He closed his Bible after his message, and he said, okay, I'm going to pray for you. All those that want me to lay hands on you, come on down here. I mean, they came running down in the front of that tent. He began to lay his hands on them, began to prophesy into their lives. Why am I saying all this? If you wait for the perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done, folks. You'll never get anything done. You see, we were very comfortable in Tulsa, very comfortable. We could have lived the rest of our life in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But last year, God called us to move out of Tulsa and to move to North Carolina and to build a family Bible training center to raise up children, teenagers, entire families in the Word of God. I'll never forget the day that we moved. Well, first of all, I said to God, okay, we'll move when the house sells. We'll move when the house sells. God said, oh, I mean, my wife said, 
we need to move by July 1st. And then God said, I mean, my wife said, I just really feel in my spirit that that's God. And I knew the same thing, but I was fighting it. I was fighting it. I said, God, when the house sells, we will move. I was waiting for the perfect conditions. And I'll never forget, there we were, driving away from the house. That wonderful July morning. <laughs> looking out the window of that truck, and there was that sign for sale in front of my house. We were going down the interstate, Interstate 40, going east. Two hours later, tears are running down my face. Two straight hours. And my wife, she thought it was because, well, you know, a lot of memories, da da da, -da living in Tulsa in 20 years, you know, we're moving away. No, no, it wasn't that. She says, you miss, you miss Tulsa, you miss the people? I says, yeah, but that's, that's not why I'm crying. Why are you crying? I said, because the devil's beating me over the head. What are you talking about? He's saying, here you're going to, here you want to build a, a, fam a family Bible training center that's going to cost millions of dollars, and you can't even sell your own house. Boom, boom. I mean, he was knocking me over the head. And I was expecting a little, a little <laughs> consoling from my wife. It'll be okay. I know what you're going through. I'm going through the same thing. She reached over in that truck and she says, in the name of Jesus. I got out of my pity party real quick. You see, if you wait for the perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. You'll never get, sir, you'll never get anything done if you're waiting for perfect conditions. I know a couple in their 40s, they're still waiting for the perfect conditions to have kids. Well, you don't know all the obstacles. Listen, you know what an obstacle is? Something you see when you take your eyes off the goal. Something you see, better write it down. Something you see when you take the eyes, your eyes off the goal. What is an obstacle? Something you see when you take your eyes off the goal. Folks, we've got to go forward. We have got to go forward. We can no longer sit down still and watch this thing go right by us. There is a sliver of time that we have. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Are you hearing what the Spirit of God is saying? Now is the time to move. Stop waiting for the perfect conditions in your church. If you're waiting for the perfect facility, it'll never come. If you're waiting for a bigger budget, it'll never come. If you're waiting for more volunteers, they'll never come. If you're waiting for the perfect pastor, he'll never be there. Listen, if you're waiting for the perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. I know down the road there's going to be an orphanage. I know that. I know that we're going to be building an orphanage. I see it. I've known it for years. Do we have an orphanage? No. But you know what we're doing? We're supporting orphanages. As a ministry, we're planting seeds into other people's lives. I know we're going to have a camp, Brother Mark. I know. I know that I know I know. And I know you're going to have a camp. You know why? You know how I know? Because you're planting seeds. You're planting seeds. That camp is coming. And I know our camp is coming. It's in there, folks. It's in there. See, if you never leave where you are, you're going to end up where you are. If you never, I know that was, if you, if you never leave where you are, you're going to end up where you are. If you never leave, you'll never arrive. I'm going very slow so everyone can get this. You'll never arrive unless you leave. You'll never get much of anything done 
unless you go ahead and do it before you're ready. That's by the Spirit, folks. You'll never get much of anything done unless you go ahead and do it before you're ready. You'll never be ready. You'll be ready when you realize you'll never be ready. The perfect time will never be there. When God says, go, go! Are you hearing what I'm saying? When God says, get up and move! He said to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 3, you've gone around this mountain long enough. And how many in this room, you've gone around the mountain long enough and you're tired of it. You're tired of it. God is looking for people that will make it happen. You see, there's three types of people in the world. Those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that wonder what happened. And then the spirit of apathy sets in. I can't do that. I'm not going to try again. Because I tried before and it didn't work. They said it would never be done. It could never be done. And I'm not going to try it again. I'm just not. Even if the pastor asked me, I'm not going to do it. I, I, I'm not going to do it. He asked me to do the Christmas program. No, I'm not going to do it. No, no. I'll show him. Oh, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, where do you want to take us? Where do you want to take us? Where do you want to take us? Just lift up your hands toward heaven right now. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, where do you want to take us? You know what most of us need to do right now? We need to park our brain. Park it, man. Park it. That's the thing that's been giving you trouble for so many years. Just park it. Close your eyes. What is the Spirit of God showing you? You'll never possess what you can't imagine. Ooh. You've had those same 25 kids in that class for too long. Can you see a hundred? Yeah, you can. Can you see 200? Yeah, you can. Can you see 500? Uh-oh. That's where the brain comes. Park it. Park it. You see, God has given every one of us a dream. I want you to look at me real quick. By the Spirit of God, God has given every one of us a dream. And some of you, your dream has been on the shelf for years. It's time to resurrect that dream. I said it's time to resurrect the dream. Mm. You'll never possess what you can't imagine. My God, what is it that you want us to do? If you wait for the perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. If you're waiting for a pat on the back, ma'am, come on. Come on. Do you always need a pat on the back to do what God has called you to do? Can't you just see in the lives of these children? Can't you just look into their eyes? Isn't that enough to keep you going? Aren't you moved with compassion? As Jesus looked out over the multitude and he said they were sheep having no shepherd. I was just sharing with Sister Paula here before the service tonight. She's gone with Mexi to Mexico with us uh, with, what, how many, 20-some people just last year. I was telling her about Guatemala. In Guatemala, there's a zone there, like we have our districts or counties. There's a zone there. It's called Zone 5. They 
put their dead children out, out by the streets like we put our garbage out by the road once a week. And the little pickup comes along, and two men just dump the dead child in the back of the pickup, and off they go to pick up more. Come on, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. He is speaking so clear. There's an urgency in the hour. We have got a sliver of time that's remaining. We don't have enough people right now. But you know, if everyone here would say, I'll answer the call. I'll answer the call. God, you can count on me. What is it that you want me to do? It'll be there when you get there. That was my biggest complaint to God. God, where's the money going to come from? Where's the money going to come from? He said, son, when you get there, the money will be there. But see, most of us are waiting for the money first. What would you do if you could not fail? Question, what would you do if you could not fail? Ah, now you're thinking big. Ooh, stand to your feet, everybody. What could you do? If I can have our musicians down here to, to help us out, thank you, guys. What would you do if you could not fail? What would you be doing? What would you be doing? A lot more than what you're doing. Sir, what would you be doing if you could not fail? Name me one thing. What would you be doing? Yeah. What would you be doing? A lot more than what you're doing right now. Sir, in the back, the tall one, what would you be doing if you could not fail? Yeah. Yeah. See, God has given every one of us a dream. He's given us a dream, a great big dream. But see, most of us are not fulfilling the call because you say, that dream is so much bigger than me. Duh. You're right. God doesn't give a dream that's your size. God always gives a dream that's bigger than you. You know why? When it comes to pass, you're not the one that can pat you up on the back and say, look what I did. You realize only God, only God did this. My sufficiency is not of myself, but my sufficiency is God, of God. I'm pulling on every one of you. I'm pulling on every one of you. You've been pulling on me all night long. Now, sir, ma'am, I'm pulling on you big time. I'm demanding, I'm demanding a response from the word that you heard. I'm expecting a response from the word that you heard. What are you going to do? Are you going to wait for the perfect conditions? I'm going to tell you again, they'll never come. They'll never, it'll never happen. Kick yourself up. Get yourself moving. We've got a job to do. We've got kids that need us. We've got young people that are going to hell because... Come on. Something's happening in the house tonight. Something big is happening in the house tonight. I don't know what you need to do, but if I were you and if God is moving on your heart, I would change your position and get on down here. If God is speaking to your heart, get on down here quick. Get on down here quick because God is about ready to resurrect something, something big, something big time in your life. It's not your job to understand. 
It's not your job to understand. Your job is to trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to figure out how it's going to happen. My God, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but as I was standing during praise and worship at the beginning of this service, from this facility, from this facility, from this Brownsville Assembly of God, over the past four and a half years, hundreds of thousands of people have received Jesus in their heart and have been delivered and set free. Whole churches are on fire because of what has taken place in this house. There is an anointing that you can grab just because you are here. There's an anointing that you can grab just because you're here at Brownsville Assembly of God. Grab that anointing that is here in this place. But just don't grab that anointing. Go further with it. What is it that God wants you to do with the anointing that's on the inside of you? For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the hour. This is the time. This is it, folks. This is it. This is it. It's time to go to a new level. Yes, ah, yeah. Kick it in gear, guys. Go. Go. Ready? Let our names in him be found. 